I am so thrilled to be here on our final day of this summit because the city is really the perfect platform for exponential technology. Cities are where our greatest problems are created and where both the talent and the ability to deploy things comes together as a solution. It's where everything we've talked about this week goes. As Jeffrey West has pointed out, cities are some of the longest living structures on Earth. They go on for thousands of years, unlike a firm that goes on for 10 or 100. So today, I want to look back and then learn forward on what we can learn and apply to our cities. First thing to start with is cities weren't doing so well not that long ago. In the 1970s in the US, here in 1975, uh, cities were losing out to the suburbs because innovation was in the suburbs, people wanted single family homes, the auto was raining, and when New York City got into trouble, the president told them to uh, drop dead. That was 75. 20 years later, things must be getting better. It's 1995, the year Netscape goes public, the internet is upon us, and what futurists are saying about cities then is, well, we're headed for the death of cities because of the growth of personal computing and the organiza distributed organization advances, clearly cities are leftover baggage from an industrial era when you can live anywhere you want. Okay, that didn't work out too well. In fact, as we know, since then, cities completely went ahead and thrived. There was something about the technology and cloud era that did it. You know, when I moved out to San Francisco about 30 years ago and went to work for Apple, this city, which we now think of as the innovation capital, and that's why we're all here, was in danger of becoming something like Venice, a formerly great commercial entrepot that was famous for its, uh, its sourdough bread. It had no real connectivity to Silicon Valley because innovation was so different then. Innovation occurred in silos, in corporate campuses. Organizations didn't talk to each other. Huge capital expenses. This is kind of what Silicon Valley uh, looked like. And, and then all of that changed around the year 2000 with the coming of the cloud and open innovation. It's why we're here. There's actually network math that shows this, and you're probably familiar with it. As you start densifying, ideas speed up. As you reduce capital costs, you can have innovation. This created this generative effect, and suddenly people moved to cities to innovate solutions. And this is really kind of part of the singularity playbook. More density, more innovation. You know, it, it used to cost a lot to do a startup. Today, you just snap to an API. This speeds things up. Large organizations have to learn from small. And that brings us to this world where cities aren't just thriving. They're the engines of global reinvention. But there's another side to this. This is a really good example of a positive feedback loop, a generative system. It's been generatively great for cities. But you know, anytime you have a runaway system, uh, there can be some unintended consequences. For example, what happened to capital? Well. In my country, capital went to about five cities. Because they became so successful, investment for new companies went to five cities. It leads to a political map that looks something like this. If you're not familiar with the United States, the blue areas are where the cities and the Democrats are. The red area is where the Republicans are, and they're not cities, and they're less happy about it because there's less growth, innovation, and employment. And then they're doubly whacked because this is where manufacturing is getting hollowed out. So um, this success of cities has kind of created a bit of our challenge and probably the reason that Gary started today with the future of work. The drivers of change in cities that have made him successful are also things that have led to populism. First, you have the network effects of tech companies. It, you know, it doesn't take that many people to run Google or Amazon. They concentrate, they concentrate wealth. We've read about that. That's exacerbated by the fact that cities do the same thing. Cities get bigger to the exclusion of smaller places which accelerates the future of work post-capitalism discussion, and it creates an imperative. The imperative is, how do we take what's good about cities and diffuse it out so that more people get the benefits? Of course, that's why we're here. We do that through global networks, through creating mechanisms where the energy, the capital, the ideas of cities can start flowing out to the edge, because of course, human talent is pretty easily, evenly distributed on the planet. It's capital and opportunity that's concentrated. Um, and that's the reason that so much of what we're seeing in cities is about localism and addressing this. For example, it's the reason that the Singularity Summit in Canada happened in Edmonton, in a capital of an extractive energy industry and not of the forthcoming industries, because of deliberate effort to want to bring it out to somewhere that, that, that needs to benefit from that, that has to change. And you see the same thing around the world. Um, 
I got so interested in this that during the Obama administration, I started working with 100 US cities and noticed each city was coming up with its own story on how to compete, how to be different. Uh, I wrote a book on this called The Maker City. And one of the things we realized is the secret to all of this is localism. That is to say, even in this hyper-connected global world, what really matters is the story that goes on in a particular city about how it's different, how it stands out, how it tells its story. And, um, and that turns out to be a key driver to change. One example that's nearby uh, here in California is Fresno. So we have these very successful coastal cities, and then we have the Central Valley. Fresno was a formerly great agricultural city. In the 40s, 50s, 60s, as the automobile came in, it gets carved up, the central city hollowed out, people moved to the suburbs, um, and, and it basically stops. And what stops even more is the mentality. Peter Diamandis talks about the fact that this is a, a, an exponential mindset. The worst thing of all is a mindset that you're not going to succeed, a mindset of no agency, I can't make a difference. So switching that around is so much of what we have to do. It's a match between what singularity thinks about and what cities need. So into Fresno comes a couple of millennials who actually don't want to listen to that old story. And their belief is there's talent here, why can't we do business the Fresno way? So they get a space, this is a former auto dealership, and within one year they do three things all at once. First of all, they start training the sons and daughters of agricultural workers, a lot of migrant workers in Fresno, and these sons and daughters of, of these Hispanic workers, the last thing they would imagine is they'd be part of the tech economy, they'd be part of this bigger inclusive thing. So not only are 2,500 a year trained and go into work, but in that same space, 200 startups exist. So now the culture is changing, you actually have startup culture, you have people who are new to this whole thing, they're in a certain kind of jazz, and and finally, that starts changing the culture of the city. This idea of doing these things all at once, well, that's what's needed in compressed uh, exponential times. And, and you see this, just as we saw in Edmonton, an extractive a town that does extractive industries that needs to change, so too in the United States. Strange bedfellows, here is our Silicon Valley Congressman Ro Khanna, together with a congressman from eastern Kentucky, from Appalachia, it's coal country. And the experiment in coal country was, hey, if you could outsource to India, is it possible to turn coal miners into coders? Hi, this is Kentucky Governor Matt Bevan. I want to say congratulations and happy graduation to those of you that are part of this first inaugural class of taking folks from the coal mines to coding. This was an auspicious goal. It was a pretty audacious goal, really. Honestly, before I started, I was very skeptical. I mean, my buddy sent me a link from a website and it said I was going to make money to code, you know. And I was coming from Eastern Kentucky, which doesn't have the best economic history. I, I thought first right off the bat, scam. Day one, I came here to see what all the hubbub was about. And then about 20 minutes of being here, they told me they were going to give me a check for $400. And my skepticism died pretty quickly right then and there. I have some experience, but I don't have a lot. And there were some things that I didn't quite grasp um, when we started it and I thought for sure I was drowning um, with all the information and I, I just didn't grasp it. But later that week um, was like my aha moment, like, oh my goodness, all this is finally starting to make sense. I can actually make something. If we can turn people into coders anywhere in the world, why not do it right here in Eastern Kentucky where we have people with the intellect, people with the desire, and people with the need for opportunity. You are pioneers in the very same way that the people who came through the Cumberland Gap we're pioneers for America. You're pioneers of an economic front. You know, as I did this book, The Maker City, I had a problem. I made up the term, Maker City. People are like, well, Peter, what's that? So now I had to come up with a definition of what this thing was. So as I cooked through it, I realized a Maker City was a place that prepared its citizens for times of economic and technological change. That was kind of like one of the top things you had to do. And then I started thinking, who else does that? And, and I realized there's such a kinship between what cities need to do and kind of the Singularity University mission, because it's, it's, it's preparing for that kind of change that cities compete on and compete for talent on. The other interesting thing about cities is, if you think about everything that we've looked at this week, disruptive changes uh, in health, uh, in AI, in manufacturing technology, these things uh, take place, they exist in cities, and cities are generally the places that come up with the problems that we have to solve. In fact, the narrative of city sounds a lot like the narrative that Peter Diamandis uses, which is we all think linearly, so we can't imagine a future that isn't more of today, and then something comes along and changes it. 
For example, you're probably all familiar with the Great Manure Crisis of 1894. The Great Manure Crisis of 1894 in which the city of London realized that in 50 years every street in London would be buried under nine feet of horseshit. Um, and it wasn't government that changed it, it was technology that came in orthogonally. And you're probably like saying, Peter, you made that up, but no, I went back to the source. It was the Horse World of London, published by the Religious Tax Society uh, in 1893. Uh, not only that, but the economics went underground as well. People used to get three pence a week for the horse manure, and then it went down to a farthing per week. So not only was it a health problem, but it was an economic problem. And we can laugh about this, but today, 2.3 billion people actually don't have access to toilets. And, and the fact that the way we imagine infrastructure in our world is there has, doesn't work. That is to say, populations are growing faster than the ability to keep up with them with the kind of 20th century infrastructure, so we have to look at things differently. And uh, you can see this in X Prize type behavior. For example, in, in uh, Dubai, the Mohammed bin Rashid Initiative had kind of a global cities challenge, an X Prize style, style challenge, in which they asked people to build solutions that would solve infrastructure problems where, in fact, traditional things wouldn't work. And what won? What was the winner? And the winner of the Sustainable Cities Challenge. That, uh, most of the underserved communities, especially in the developing economies, they lack basic facilities like uh, sanitation and uh, drinking water facilities, which basically leads to a lot of communicable diseases, and uh, hundreds of children die every day because of these communicable diseases. My name is Mayank Mehta. I am the co-founder of Garf Toilets. We provide a solution for smart sanitation in the urban slum communities, underserved areas. You're thinking, okay, Peter, you're, you're, you're very excited that a toilet won, but why? Here's four things that happen. It turns human refuse into fuel and fertilizer, creates a market for it, so it actually creates value for it. They're getting ahead of what London did. Uh, they then put a network of people together locally to make money on that, and it actually collects public health information. And, okay, now you're thinking, okay, enough with the toilets already, but I'm not the only guy who gets excited about that. There's Bill Gates, uh, who actually had a similar challenge on this. And the point of this isn't just toilets. It's if you can imagine sanitation without sewers, you can start imagining solving big problems in completely new ways. In fact, uh, the MIT Media Lab is, is pioneering a major uh, project that's actually looking at cities without. What are power without grids or sanitation without sewers? How do you do communications without carriers or access to uh, buildings without ownership? Consensus without authority. This is in conjunction with uh, the Norman Foster Foundation. In fact, they're having a conference on this, which you're invited to in Hamburg in October. But this suggests that we can approach infrastructure completely differently. Uh, it's the application of exponential technologies, and there are a number of ways this happens. Uh, we've heard a lot about food without soil here. Uh, cows are a particularly inefficient uh, a factory for food, and we need to get food closer to our cities. And so uh, one of the key things we're looking at now is, is urban agriculture. We see a series of startups there, and this is true in many places. Uh, Puerto Rico in the United States, on, in some level, is our lab for resilience. When resilient problems hit North America, the United States, they show up there first, whether it's hurricane or, in this case, food security. Puerto Rico, a lush island, has a two-week food supply. Um, they have to import 80% of their food, and this has to do with some of their colonial history where uh, it wasn't so good to be an agricultural worker, and yet here is a place that could completely pioneer this stuff. And so the opportunity to put things to work there or in other developing uh, areas is, is completely exciting. Likewise, power without grids. Um, Puerto Rico is one of the worst places you can put a centralized power grid. In, in their case, the generations down south, the people live up north and a hurricane comes, and this is the one place you would want highly distributed mechanisms. And what this whole without movement points out is that the distributed nature of technology today can make an enormous difference there. So you have exponential, you have distributed. The other big thing in cities is this bit about inclusion. The whole smart cities movement, well, city planning in general, has a reputation for being top down. It's kind of like a planner comes in and tells you what to do. Well, in this wiki distributed world, we want to get people not only involved in kind of doing startups, but collaborating on, on actually solving problems in cities. Earlier I said kind of the great 
moment in Silicon Valley that started you know, transforming things was the arrival of the cloud and the fact that it opened things up. The other thing was the API. When cities started opening their data and people could actually start solving problems, it was an enormous invitation. It said, come mess with me. And when you start disseminating this technology into the schools and among people, you can really transform and empower a population. One of my favorite examples is in Barcelona. If you've been there, you know it's very noisy at night. The city didn't measure that, so there was nothing to enforce until the population got together, measured it, deployed the sensors, and changed the laws. In the heart of bustling Barcelona, Plaza del Sol has become a popular place for friends to meet, relax, and enjoy a drink or two. But I spare a thought for the residents who live here. For many families like this one, the noise became unbearable. They go to buy drinks and beer, they go party, they sing a song a lot. And for me, at mornings, I'm very tired because I can sleep good. I open the window and say, shut up, please. <laughs> and she say, sorry, sorry, sorry. But the residents here have had some surprising help from this sensor technology made right here in Barcelona. So. By putting the sensors by windows and on balconies, the families were able to prove that the noise levels at night were reaching 100 decibels far higher than the World Health Organization's recommendations. Armed with their data, the residents went to the council who agreed to make some changes. Now the police move people on at 11pm and new plant pots stop people sitting on the steps to drink. It's more better because the people not, not sit down here in the place. Now we sleep a lot of the night and it's more good. We've kind of come off of the first era of smart cities technology that was about sensors, cloud, and mobile. That stuff's great for data and surveillance. We're now moving on to distributed infrastructure and the application of intelligence and AI to things. That's important because uh, we have to do a lot of things smarter. The world's adding about 3,600 buildings a day. China's adding a London a year for the next 32 years. 30% of that goes to waste. So the question is, how can you use machine learning and, and technology to start fixing that. Here's Van Wien that builds affordable housing in the Netherlands. It's not only built ahead of time, but there's an objective function it wants to solve for. How do you maximize the unique views, solar gain, cost, profit, and variety? How can you learn from other housing and, and essentially keep running it so that it reduces its cost and becomes 40 or 50 percent more efficient? Those same things can be applied to actually building technologies and even how we learn them. Autodesk, that builds a lot of tools in this arena, here's a design tool. It actually looks at how you're learning. So the, the machine learning looks at how you're learning, tells you, well, here's what your skills are. Here are skills you probably should learn because other people like you are doing it. Here are the kind of projects you can work on. And then if there are things you don't know, we want the system just in time to teach you that stuff because you want to bring more people in to meet the housing crisis and develop things. And then as it teaches you stuff, it can start saying, well, here are the industries you're good for. And you could actually imagine something like this that looks at industries then starting to hook you up with particular employers. And in fact, that's something that's going on. Um, this same technology can also make the interior of buildings more responsive. This is Autodesk's Mars Innovation Center in Toronto. It measures how well people are collaborating, uh, interactions. Uh, the same technology can apply to a neonatal unit. If it's not performing, how does a building write an RFP to become more efficient? And you can also apply this to planning. So we've talked a lot about things you need to solve for in cities, but oftentimes collaboration takes a very long time. Here's a project at MIT called CityScope. It's a physical model of a city, but then mapped into that are all the things you do if you were trying to do city planning. Are we solving for third places, innovation, building energy? All of these trade-offs that are often very difficult, you can both optimize them and have a conversation around them. Um, and, and that leads to a form of algorithmic governance, but engaging people. There's always that trade-off. One interesting example was Hamburg. Hamburg was expecting the Olympics, but then lots and lots of refugees came up. And the question is, how do you plan for that? Because there's no plan for planning for that. Groups of people start getting around and start figuring out if we actually put employment and housing in a place, what would it look like? And through rapid iterations, you start getting consensus. And technology like that can all the way be brought to how do you actually keep wealth within a system? For example, if you can measure externalities, uh, either volunteering or arts or contributing back to the community or buying within the community, 
can you keep wealth in and not extracting out? This is where we start getting into new forms of currency and blockchain. So all of these things become ways of uh, making cities uh, smarter and more capable and weaving in exponential technologies. But there's one more thing I'd like to, uh, to end up on, which is the role of the arts in all of this. Um, at a time of such change and of so much hard science, it turns out that sometimes the best way to experience this is emotionally. And that's a big part of what cities do. They have art, they have symphonies, they have theater. And uh, in San Francisco, we have an organization called Gray Area, which is an art and technology center. And, and recently, we started playing with this. I want to kind of go out and show you how we're dealing with a couple of exponential technologies. Um, a great deal of anxiety about the future of, of, of robots and us and interspecies. So recently at Gray Area, in our experimental research lab, we created this. This was Inferno. These are exoskeletons that people are wearing. And when the music starts, they're not dancing. They're being danced by the machine. Now, the artist who made this thought this would be a very disturbing piece of art because you're being controlled. The odd result was everybody who went through this was delighted. There was almost a, a sereneness, a flow, in interacting with some other te technology, some other species. People had never encountered the species before, and, and there was a great deal of delight. And you know, you're actually thinking through, am I submitting to machines? How do I interact with it? But an experience like this was an amazing way to both introduce people to the technology and for an art project to work through, what is the dialogue between us and robots, and how can culture help? Here's another example. This is Eleven Play. It's a dance group. The women are all outfitted with sensors. The data goes in, visualization data goes into a machine learning system. And then it projects an avatar, a generative avatar. So now they're dancing with something that's made by an AI. So you have a human in jazz with something else. Um, but they're learning from each other. Half, oh, at the end, they all dance with drones. Halfway through it, it switches from the human being in the lead to the avatar being in the lead. Well, most of our stories about us and AIs are, they kind of don't end well. The robots take over. Repeatedly, when we do these things, we find there's more creativity. And this is the through line to some of the things we've seen. Autodesk, with its technology that's training you, you actually get more creative. The human finds out what he's good at, where his judgment fits in. Um, and so kind of what we've seen in all of this is cities are the cauldron where this stuff gets created. They're the home of our problems. Through distributed networks, you're actually coming up with a lot of these new solutions. And and as we work them through, we should work them through as kind of product people solving problems, but also creative people working this through in only the way that we can, imagining new things and having to feed that. The final project we're doing at Gray Area, uh, so, so one of the things we're trying to do is, if you're building these new forms of immersive entertainment, uh, can you make money at them? Can they be a new form of art, the way that games are art or dance is art? And so, we funded a whole bunch of people to go off and work on something. We thought we'd have them do stuff around, uh, uh, around privacy or dystopian issues, but everybody came back and said, we want to build immersive art about the future of our cities, about reworlding, about the system nature of the earth. So that's what folks are working on now, combination of the arts and innovation to take a look at where our cities are going. Um, this is just a taste of why cities, I think, are the platform for so much of what we're working on here and why the purpose of a city is to prepare people for change and why there's such an interesting match between what Singularity is doing in a bunch of cities, all of whom are attempting these things, and this great yearning that all of you have to be in a network connected up because that's actually the great work of putting creativity to work right now. That's why I call this looking back, taking a look at where we've been cities but learning forward because there's this tight connection between exponentialism and, and problem solving, and you guys are right in the middle of it. Thank you.